Um, so my name is Kevin Dupont. I am from the Fletcher School at Tufts, the School of International Affairs, and that is my background, is international affairs and working for the U.S. government. But I also spent part of um, my past in Dubai, which is kind of where this uh, topic area originated from. Um, and this is just in a topic area of interest for me as I study the Middle East, particularly the Gulf. I think this is important to really, um, it's a conversation that needs to happen um, because it's an ever, ever rising topic. So I found this from the UN. It's types of human trafficking within um, the GCC states, or then really the Middle East in general. And I think the most important one we're looking at here is the orangey red color. Sorry, I'm colorblind, so I think that's orange. Um, <laughs> uh, forced sexual exploitation, 21.5%, uh, 4.5 million people. Why? Why the GCC states? Um, the, the, these states are highlighted in green. Uh, women are brought to the Middle East for varying reasons. The first is under presumption that they will be um, doing low-paying jobs like cleaning houses, serving in restaurants, being a nanny for a wealthy family, things like we've talked about before here. Um, or, in some cases, women are attracted to the glitz and glamour of these major cities um, that they live in. Um, because they live in below poverty level conditions in their native country, then we'll come to the Middle East thinking that either some form of sexual labor or this low paying labor will be a, a uh, easier way to earn money, but in a wealthy place. However, this is not the case as we have seen. Um, in reality, women are tricked into believing that these jobs are set up for them, um, but then upon arrival, their passports are seized and they're entered into a life of prostitution, um, escorting perhaps or even uh, forced marriages in some countries. Um, I th an important thing I want to also mention is many of these states don't have a lower class or a, a, even a, a really a, a poverty line per se, as they often pay their nationals quite handsomely and give them well-paying jobs. Then in turn, the middle class, as we would call in the United <laughs> States, um, of countries like Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, um, the, these people are expatriates, like I was, I was one of them. Um, who don't won't do this kind of lower cleaning lower I should say um, cleaning level work so then that goes on to the migrant workers um, I think it's important to kind of note that these societies don't have the same societal makeup that Western countries have um, the GCC is a major source of trafficking due to lenient visa policies uh, the UAE particularly has I think 140 countries that it gives visa free entry to which is quite high um, has th these countries have very flexible immigration laws, and there's a lack of due diligence surrounding potential trafficking networks, um, which I think is very important. Um, women are trafficked from third world countries, um, and other, these countries including, but not limited to, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, the Philippines, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, and um, as well as Pakistan. So the most chronic offenders of human trafficking that I have found, or female trafficking particularly, are Kuwait, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, as we've heard many times here, uh, Bahrain, and Qatar, with the major cities seeing the most trafficking. Those would include Kuwait City, Dubai, uh, Manama in Bahrain, Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, and Doha. Um, but there is legislation in place to prevent this trafficking, which all of these countries have signed. It's called the Palermo Protocols. It was actually signed in 2000, but it hasn't really been updated since then. Um, and it focused more on transnational organized crime, not so granularly as uh, human security or human trafficking. Where, so this map is a, a, kind of fun to look at. Um, looking at kind of where these trafficking victims originate from, mostly East Asia um, and South Asia, and then move towards what you see is the Middle East. Um, and interesting enough, interestingly enough, a lot to North America. Societal norms are really at play. Um, the kafala system, which we've heard, uh, we just heard briefly from Allah, um, is a key institution defining rights of the two main parties, um, the sponsor or the employer and the foreign sponsored migrant or the employee. Particularly, uh, Qatari law distinguishes these two types, two types of sponsors, residency sponsor and exit sponsor. Um, so female migrant workers trafficked from East, 
uh, in South Asia and the Pacific are legally treated as slaves, um, with employers granting them visas and jobs, retaining the rights to commit human rights abuses evident in Qatar's efforts to construct the World Cup stadium for 2022. Now that's in about three years. Um, so this is still ongoing and will continue to ongo as Qatar tries to build um, these stadiums. I think it's important that this is still something that's going on and will continue to go on for the next few years. Um, going back to that note on residency sponsors, um, these sponsors invite the migrant worker, um, which they are called makful, um, by providing entry visas and then the job and then the supposed salary. Uh, the sponsor gives the work visa, entry to the country, and then becomes their, therefore responsible for the employee through entering into a contract, which doesn't actually usually happen. Um, this exchange, the makfu or the migrant worker, must meet obligations requested by the residency sponsor um, until they are granted permission to leave the country. Now, as we've heard from many different testimonies today, that can be a wide range of things from um, these duties to also um, to sexual obligations and, and many others. Um, the exit sponsor is a different person, may take over the obligations owed by the uh, migrant worker um, and those obligations back to the residency sponsor um, before the migrant worker can leave the state fulfilling the owed obligations. So that's actually kind of two layers that these migrant workers have to go through under Qatari law. Ultimately though, as we see, this relationship is built on power and balance. Um, residency sponsors have legal authority over the migrant workers' wages, housing, access to food, water, ability to seek their own work, leave the country, uh, even speaking to their family, have access to their passport. Um, ultimately, then, kafala is a modernized form of slavery, just under a different name. This example I found was very interesting. Um, it is of a Syrian refugee um, in Saudi sex tourism, um, or so it, it claims. Uh, recently, instance, instances of trafficking uh, Mauritanian child brides from Africa to Saudi Arabia is on the rise. 46 um, poor Mauritanian families are lured into selling their uh, young, often prepubescent daughters to wealthy Saudi men um, for hefty uh, prices of about 20,000 US dollars. Once these, uh, these children arrive to Saudi Arabia, they become sex slaves to their husbands. And once girls reach puberty or become pregnant, they are no longer wanted and thrown into the streets. And after that, who knows? So can we stop something that's so ingrained in these societies? Um, like I said, legislation is in place, but nothing is being acted upon. Uh, this is really ultimately a black market and an informal economy system that is difficult to control. Uh, this is the area that I study is the black market and illicit financing in the Gulf. Um, and this is extremely hard to really pinpoint and, and um, try and prevent. I would say that international response is necessary, sanctions perhaps, or boycotting major events. Uh, these responses must come from macro levels or higher levels and then trickle down. That's really the only way that these countries will truly see the impact of their actions if it comes from a larger scale. US policymakers will not act do not want to cause international incidences over human security issues which they deem minor. Uh, issues like female trafficking are not making the news headlines as much as we would want them to. It's a controversial topic that no one likes to talk about, per se. And like I said, this black market informal economy is difficult to track, never mind trying to get the uh, people in and out of it. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you.